Emmanuel, welcome back to online worship. So great to see you. This is our third Sunday in Lent as we're making our journey to the cross and to the empty tomb on Easter. Be sure to pick up Lenten devotionals. You can find out more about them in the community life or pick them up at the church. And uh, we have some very, very important news uh, about uh, Emmanuel online. So pay attention uh, to this announcement right here. We are in the midst of a major shift of how we're doing online worship. So I want you to, to know about the timing of this. We have been pre-recording um, our entire services uh, throughout this pandemic, and this Sunday marks exactly two years. But uh, we are going to continue to have online worship, but we're going to deliver it in a little different way. Uh, beginning the first Sunday in April, we are going to go to live stream. So what that means is most of the time you won't be seeing pre-recorded worship, maybe here and there we will, but it's going to be live streamed. So it's going to be on YouTube. You watch it in the same place you normally do. So you can either watch it live as it's happening in the sanctuary Sunday morning right now. It's at 10 a.m. Or um, as soon as that's done live streaming, it records it and it will be on the website. So you can watch it anytime after that. For example, let's say you stay up real late on Saturday nights and, and you watch the service Saturday night. What you'll need to do is either watch it Sunday or Sunday night and it will be um, on the website. But we'll tell you more about it, but just wanted to uh, prepare all of you for that shift. We're excited about it and we'll give you a sense of what worship is like in our sanctuary. Emmanuel Immersion is coming up on uh, Sunday, April 3rd at my home. Uh, at 2 p.m. It's a great time to get to meet other people at the church. You can get to know our, uh, some of our church leaders, uh, myself, and there's an opportunity to join Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Uh, you can call the church office uh, to reserve a spot for that. And then finally, there's Casa Maria uh, coming up this Saturday, upcoming Saturday, March 26th. Um, in the church parking lot where we bring in our lunches for Casa Maria. And uh, we thank you so much for your uh, care for those that are in need. St. Patrick's 
and uh, we're offering it in honor of St. Patrick's Day uh, earlier this week. Let us pray. Come I this day to the Father, come I this day to the Son, come I to the Holy Spirit powerful, come I this day with God, come I this day with Christ, come I with the Spirit of kindly balm, God and Spirit and Jesus, from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, Come I with my reputation, come I with my testimony, come I to thee, Jesu, Jesu, shelter me. Amen. children, what does it mean to be pure in heart? Let's hear what they have to say. I think it means to be pure in heart to me, to be loving and honest. Easter? Being honest about you getting in trouble. Uh, love. Pure, you know, like pureness 
and, and trustworthiness. Pure trustworthiness means like you're being truthful. Oh, oh, thanks for sharing. Do you ever forget to wash or use your hand sanitizer? I think we all forget occasionally. In Bible times, there were religious laws and traditions for food and people's hands to make sure nothing was unclean. The religious leaders got upset that the disciples sometimes forgot these laws, kind of like we do once in a while. And Jesus told the religious leaders that what comes out of their mouth is more important than what you put into it. He said that the words that come out of our mouth come from our heart, and those words show whether you are clean or unclean. Today we're hearing Jesus talk about being pure in heart. I'm sure you've heard the children's rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That sounds nice, but it really isn't true. I mean, words really can hurt. Maybe there's a time when we've been hurt by someone's words. Maybe there's a time when we've hurt others by our words. God hears every word we say, and he knows every thought we have in our heart. It is very important for us to be careful about the things that we think and say, because hateful words come from an unclean heart. This week, remember to wash and sanitize your hands and speak kind words to others. Have a great week. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Lord God, what are we without you? As we approach your word, give us purity of heart, the sincerity, authenticity, and clarity to receive and enact your understanding and illumination. Give our intellect the wisdom, O oh God, to comprehend what is the one thing, which is to be holy as God is holy. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Sermon on the Mount, in specific the Beatitudes, and today we find ourselves in the sixth Beatitude of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. Thanks be to God. What do you really want? Philosophers and anthropologists and pop singers debate what sets human beings apart from the animal kingdom. Is it rationality or language or awareness of mortality, self-consciousness or the ability to blush? But some other traits of us homo sapiens definitely set us apart, and that's our indecisiveness, our conflicting desires, our uncertainty, and our struggle to find meaning in our lives. Russian film director Andrei Tarkovsky tackles this theme in his classic movie Stalker considered by many to be a cinematic masterpiece. It's set in what seems to be a post-apocalyptic future, and the story focuses upon the title character, Stalker, who is a guide for two characters, known only as the writer, who is searching for a story, and the scientist, who is searching for a discovery. They make a dangerous journey into a mysterious region called the Zone. And this journey into the center of the Zone is filmed as a very long odyssey, almost a spiritual pilgrimage that they're going on. And it's rumored that there's a room found in the Zone that will grant your deepest, inmost 
desires. Your heart's desire will come true in the zone. And in this room, you'll get exactly what you want. The three finally make it to the threshold of the room. But before venturing in, the writer asks his guide, what if I don't know what I want? The room will decide for you. The room reveals what you truly want in life. Even if you yourself are unconscious of it, the room reveals all. Not what you think you want, but what you actually want. Now, like the scientist and like the writer, each of us have to ask ourselves some pretty tough questions before we cross that threshold into the room. What do I really want? What do I want in my life? What's most important to me? What do I really value? And what do I do if I don't know what I want to do? Now, Carl Jung described this dilemma when he said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So this morning's beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, it helps us to make the unconscious conscious. And Jesus challenges us to do some real self-examination here, and it's very fitting for this season of Lent. You see, our, our actions, they bubble up from what we desire in our heart of hearts, the, the zone of our lives, of what we value. Now, sometimes we're aware of these desires and values, and other times we're totally oblivious to them, or we are in denial of them. Now, it was Soren Kierkegaard who explored this in his classic book, Purity of Heart. And he makes the case that we human beings naturally have very distracted minds and divided hearts. Christ, in his mercy, summons us to a life of taking up our cross and a life of self-examination. And so Kierkegaard argues that the opposite of purity of heart is double-mindedness, a wavering heart that's tossed to and fro by the winds of opinions of the day or is dulled by people-pleasing or appeasing other people. Uh, Double-mindedness, according to Kierkegaard, is also a life that has been lulled to sleep by things like pleasure and a soul that has been numbed to not feel such things as suffering or remorse. Double-mindedness glosses over the tough questions in life. It's a distracted mind that goes in a million different directions at one time, everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Basically, it's living an unchallenged, unreflective life, an unlived life. Then Kierkegaard, the philosopher prophet of Copenhagen, Denmark, says these words. Purify your hearts of double-mindedness. Let your heart in truth will only one thing. For therein is the heart's purity to will the good. Now Kierkegaard tells us what it means further throughout this book to will that one thing, to will the good. For Kierkegaard, it's to respond to Christ's summons to take up your cross and follow him. It's to respond to Christ's offer of abundant living. It is to live wholeheartedly and not out of duplicity or hypocrisy in your life. To will one thing is to hold fast to God to love with all of your love, to have the sum of your life be the proof of your convictions, to will to be holy as God is holy, Kierkegaard says, to will God's will. 
And this is what Jesus calls us to do, too. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Thy what be done? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we pray, Lord, lead, lead us not into what? In the Lord's Prayer, temptation. Lead us not into temptation. And so an impure heart succumbs to a self-centered life, a selfie life. But a pure life, a pure heart, is a godly life that has undivided allegiance to God and God alone in every aspect of life. It's an integrated life of integrity. So you ask yourselves the tough questions of what are you willing to die for? What am I willing to live for? That's purity of heart. That's your one thing. And blessed are you if it's God that you hunger and thirst for. In Costa Rica, they call it pura vida, the pure life or the free life, where your motives are unmixed. There's no guile in you. There's a consistency where we are unwavering disciples, not fair weather friends of Jesus. And so we pay attention in our lives to our motives and our desires. Why do we do what we do? Purity of heart. The pure in heart are set free. They are free indeed by the Holy Spirit, but they are also spirit-led and they are spirit-controlled. They are both bound and they are free by God. And then the Spirit is invited in to sift and to refine our desires and our motives. The pure in heart have a clear conscience. There's nothing to hide. And so we can be honest in our personal and in our business dealings. We have healthy and appropriate boundaries in our lives. In other words, we have sexual character. We don't exploit others for our own purposes or pleasure or gain. So purity of heart means also that you guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life, as the book of Proverbs says. And so we protect our hearts when we're pure of heart, from the contaminations of such things as hatred, of lust, of judgmentalism, of resentment and fear. We have a dependent, wonder-filled, childlike trust when we are pure of heart. We're wise as serpents and innocent as what? Doves, the scriptures say. But to be pure in heart isn't to be naive. Rather, you are single-minded, you are focused, you are genuine, you are authentic. Now, there's a simplicity and there is a real depth to those who have purity of heart. It's kind of a spiritual minimalism where we are grounded and rooted rather than being fragmented. We are in union with Christ. We know that without Christ Jesus, our righteousness is just like filthy rags, as the scriptures say. Now, the heart. The heart is very important in the scriptures, and it has a, a different meaning of what we understand the heart as today. For us, the heart is your emotions and your passions. In the Bible, the heart goes encompasses more things. It's the very center of your being, is your heart. It includes not only your emotions and your passions, but your will, your thoughts, your understanding. It is the core of your being, who you truly are. Where your treasure is, says Jesus, there your heart will be also. So purity of heart is treasuring the right things the lasting things, the eternal things, the invisible things, the things that only the mind's eye can perceive. 
The Little Prince is the fourth most translated book in the world, and it's sold nearly 200 million copies. And there's a famous scene where a fox meets the young prince during his travels on Earth. At this point, the little prince is lost in the desert. He's exhausted, he's defeated, and he's feeling insignificant. He scales a large mountain, and he sees the vast landscape that's before him. And he cries out, and the only thing that he hears is the echo of his voice. The little prince finally just lays down and he weeps, bitterly crying tears of hopelessness and loneliness. But then a fox comes along and the two strike up a friendship. The fox's presence and wise words are a great source of comfort for the little prince. But eventually the two part ways. And before saying goodbye, the fox offered the gift of a secret to the boy. And the essence of the story can be found in the words that are uttered by the fox. One sees clearly only with the heart. What is essential is invisible to the eyes. You see, that's exactly what this beatitude teaches us, to see with the heart. See, faith is the assurance of things unseen. And so faith helps us to see what's invisible to our eyes. And the pure in heart desire to see the invisible. They long to see the invisible, all-wise God. But they know their true heart condition, what it is apart from Christ. King David is tapped into this when he cries out in Psalm 51, Create in me a clean what, O God? Heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Blow the dust off my heart, O Spirit of God. Burn the dross, O consuming fire. Boil away the germs, O holy God. Baptize me in the Jordan River, O oh, living water. In other words, the pure in heart know that they're not pure in heart of themselves. They know that purity is a gift. Purity isn't perfection. It isn't being puritanical or being prudish. It's humbly looking to God for purification. Purification, not perfection. And also, the pure in heart know that grace gives us grit for the struggle, where we can live into and struggle into who we are in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we live into the Beatitudes. You see, to be pure in heart is to live into the other Beatitudes of being poor in spirit, of mourning our sins, of being meek and hungering and thirsting after righteousness and justice, of being a merciful person and a peacemaker and suffering for our faith in Christ's name. That is purity of heart. Purity of heart helps us to see God more clearly, to understand and experience God's character, his loving character in our lives. And we know that best through Jesus. And Jesus says these words, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. But here's a really, really interesting thing. Purity of heart helps us see God in others more clearly. Seek God in the miserable, erring, and laboring ones. Martin Luther once wrote, for that is where one sees God. There the heart becomes pure and all arrogance lies down. You see, purity of heart deepens all of our relationships and makes it more loving. Our relationship with God, our relationship with one another and with ourselves. Pure of heart, are blessed because they receive the gift of 
God's very presence. Paul famously writes in the love chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, these words. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. On earth, it's a dark glass. In heaven, it's face to face. On earth, we know in part. In heaven, we know in full. To close, I'd like to uh, share a few uh, sentences from a sermon from Anglican priest and poet John Donne, who said these words about the pure in heart centuries ago. This world and the next world are the same house to the pure in heart. So the joy which the pure in heart have here is not a joy severed from the joy in heaven, but a joy that begins in us here and continues and accompanies us thither. There, flowers on. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Amen. Please join me now in praying for all people. Merciful God, help us to be among the pure in heart. May your pure light shine in our hearts and dispel every shadow, every layer and fold that conceals or pretends. Remove from our hearts everything that keeps us from seeing you clearly. Lord, as we journey through Lent, refresh, renew, and restore us in your service. We pray for those whose life has become dull and dry. We remember churches struggling for survival and those grappling with division. We pray for those drained of energy and resources. We remember especially those who thirst for your presence and your saving power. 
Comfort with the grace of your Holy Spirit all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for their faith. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow or mourning. Grant us comfort and care. Heavenly Parent of all, be with those in crisis as Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues and those in Pakistan mourn loved ones senselessly lost. We pray for those wrestling with natural disaster and those dealing with long COVID. Help all of us to see our way through by looking to you for hope and calm. Merciful God, give us strength and courage to live in faithful obedience to your will. Guard our hearts and minds for all that might distract us. Help us to find our true worth in knowing you more fully and serving you more faithfully by praying as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. charge and the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.